Hey YouTubers, it's been a while. It's been super busy at work, living on an airplane. I finally have a minute to take some lunch and do a walk through the substation with you guys. Uh, this substation is not quite complete, so I just want to preface that. If you guys notice things that aren't complete, uh, we're kind of one of the reasons why I'm here now is just to kind of do a walk through. And I figured I'd just kind of film that, pun you can call it a punch list walk. Um, just to see kind of what things I look for and generally how that goes. Um, I'll talk to you real quick about the switch yard and then go from there. So this substation is always feeding somewhere to utility. Um, that power go along with this communication, which we'll talk about, goes up. And it goes out to the world, out to the utility. The, the utility yard is right here, about 200 yards away. Sometimes the, the yard is 60 miles away. Sometimes it's literally right here against the fence. It just all depends on, you know, number of factors. So this particular interconnect is about 200 yards away. Um, one of the first things here to talk about, this is um, fiber optic enclosure. They call it a bulletproof and crystal round. Uh, so this is the main communication between the two yards. It's, uh, well, it starts, it's not necessarily starts, it starts and ends. Over at that yard, it goes up above on the static line. It's called OPGW, optical fiber ground wire. And it is used as both a static for, you know, lightning strikes, things like that. And in the middle of it is a hollow core of steel and the fibers are inside of it. So that's why you see this, um, this wire going inside. The center strand is, uh, there's 48 counts in there. You can get this wire with hundreds of, of fibers. You can get it with just 12. Uh, obviously, it's, you know, more money for more fibers. Anyway, uh, that fiber optic the OPGW cable goes into this box where we splice it into an underground type fiber there, non-metallic, and then that goes into the substation. The purpose of that is for communication between the two yards. So if you have some sort of uh, trip or transfer trip and you need to trip this breaker and the utilities breaker over there, it'll all be done through that fiber optic cable. Sometimes we also get our internet from there. In this case, we, we have a, another local fiber optic uh, run coming in from the local, you know, local communication company. But sometimes our internet comes through there as well. Um, that also gives the utility the ability to control this wind farm. That's actually a contractual requirement. And what they can do is they can shut you off. They can curtail you. Uh, curtailment is basically say this farm is 150 megawatts, they might call and say, hey, we've got enough generation on our grid. We don't want you to make 150 megawatts. We only need you to make 20 megawatts or 50 megawatts, whatever it could be. And you have to, within a certain period of time, minutes, curtail your wind farm back to that amount. It's really a bad word in this industry because that means money out the door, right? You can produce 150 megawatts and you're only allowed to produce something less, right? Less money in your pocket. So uh, the utility has the ability to shut you down, to curtail you themselves if you don't do it within a certain amount of time. So that's pretty interesting. And one of the other reasons why we have this, the utility can also grab our meter, meter data. They can also see our alarm points and our SCADA information. There's a ton that you, we get through this. So I'm gonna switch to wide mode now. There we go. Because uh, I want to talk about punch list walk. So I always start on the high side. Uh, I see that we need some supports for our liquid tight flex metal conduit here. Uh, you have to normally, uh, you have to um, support it within, I think it's either 12 or 18 inches of, of the box that it leaves or device it leaves. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Any sea gas will be jumping me. I don't have that memorized. 12 or 18 inches. So you need to put some supports there. Also, we're using this, uh, this flex to run the fiber in which is just fine but we need to put some duct seal on there so the water doesn't get in uh, we do have torque marks on our foundation bolts but we don't have any on some of our grounds so we'll, we'll work on that a little bit moving over to our high side switch this is a, a double end brake meaning it breaks on both ends and twists in the middle uh, what I'd like to do is usually operate these in this case it's been locked out by the utility to protect themselves and it's locked out by us oh man it's not locked out it was yesterday, so I'm going to go back in and turn this on and, and I'll operate it just to make sure that it's opening and closing right. A couple small things we need to do in here. 
Um, there's a mounting plate we need to we need to mount. A little cleanup. There should be an open and close. This goes on this uh, this torque tube or this axle here, and it will rotate, right? So when it's when it's open, this should be right in the center. When it closes, this will move, right? And then we should see the close right in front of you when it is closed. So we need to mount those. Just do a little bit of general cleanup. Uh, same with the mount on the on the uh, liquid tight flexible conduit over on that side. Moving on along to the CCVTs, you could have CCVTs, CVTs, PTs. Uh, they're all different types of transformers that do roughly the same thing. They're converting the high side voltage down to a manageable voltage. Uh, and that manageable vo voltage in this case is 67 volts and 120 volts. So we'll open this up. This is where all the connections come in. So they come in from the CCVTs and then they run into the building. What this does is it monitors the voltage and it brings the voltage down to a level that you can have in this control house. Obviously you can't bring control, uh, the one 345, 345,000 volts into that control house. Super dangerous, not enough clearances, right? So this simply breaks it down into a manageable voltage and it's uh, relative to the high side voltage. So if you have 120 volts, then that means you have 345 on the, on the high side. If you have 110 volts, that might mean you only have, you know, 330 on the high side. So it's just a ratio of the high side voltage. Get this closed and we'll move on to the next item. All right, we'll go into the control house real quick. It's not done yet. But I'm just taking a look around, see what we got. You know, a little bit of trash cleanup. Usually we'll put the panels on after we energize the sub. Battery chargers working. A little cleanup. Got the batteries. It's weird on the top, so. So that's negative. Is this positive, really? Wow, okay. Um, so these these batteries, I don't know how many there are here, but they're usually about a volt or two, and you put them in series. So if you have 120 batteries that are one volt each, and you put them in series, you get 120 volts. That's what we use here in, in most substations. There's 120 volts DC. What's interesting is, even though this is wide angle, I've got a couple of feet between these two. So if you were to like put your hand on this, put your hand on that, it would shock the hell out of you. If you were to put a conduit on top of here, like a metallic conduit, that would blow up it would that would melt so that's interesting um and i think we should put some protection on top of that somehow even a piece of flat plexiglass we can just you know dr screw right in, into those uh, threaded holes but that's that's nuts that needs to be protected uh they put the fire extinguishers on those are the test switch covers those go on when we're done panel covers go on when we're done ATS is working. So everything looks pretty good in here. Got to arm the hand wash station. A lot of people will come in here and pull this and when you pull it, it will it will pop these off and it will start dumping out the liquid that's behind here to wash your eyes. So this is here mainly for the batteries. Um, many times I've seen the owners come in, they arm it, meaning they stick these in so it's permanent. And they'll go, what is this? And they'll pull it, and then they'll squirt out. And once that happens, you're done. You lose the entire thing. It's a couple hundred dollars to replace that solution, but it's going to happen many times. So now we just wait till the absolute last second to hook those up to prevent accidental discharges. So that's a quick run through with the control house. All right, moving on. I did notice we need some fuses as well inside that cabinet, so we'll make a note. So moving on to the high side breaker. Um, man, I don't even know if this is a 345 yard. These insulators don't look long enough. It might be a 230. I'll look when we get to the transformer. But anyway, this is an SF6 breaker. Sulfur hexafluoride is the insulation gas, which allows this to be so small for the voltage. You can see that the insulators are, you know, four and a half feet long. So that keeps the energized conductor from jumping to ground. But with this gas, it can, there's a center core inside this tube, which is the energized conductor. That 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 uh, core inside is only three inches from from ground, right? Three inches from this case, 
but the three inches or so is filled with that sulfur hexafluoride gas and that prevents it from jumping. It's, it's an insulator. It's a gaseous insulator. It's pretty awesome. It's heavier than air. It's an inert gas. You can have a, a stun gun and stick the stun gun inside of a tank of that gas and the stun gun will not work. It's pretty interesting. So a quick look. Those are CT circuits. We need to put some covers on, do some general wiring cleanup. This is mainly your power and your um, normally open, normally closed, contacts, things like that. So we are going to put some cleanup on this one. Everything's grounded. We need some torque marks, some general cleanup on the foundations. Uh, moving on to the transformer. I'm not sure who makes this one, uh, but we'll see together, see what's going on. TE, I guess, or FE, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm looking at the general layout here. Secondary, primary. Okay, so this is a 138 yard. High side, 138. Low side, basically 35 kV. So it's a 138 yard. The insulators didn't look quite long enough. So what I can tell from this is there's a tap changer on it. These are all the steps of the tap changer. Position one, down to position 33. Everything's pretty normal here. So 138 yard. And then it's a Scott O&AN. We talked about that. Oil natural, air natural. So that would be um, just the oil with no fans. Then O&AF is oil natural air fan stage one. And then O&AF stage two. So we have two stages of fans. What else can I see from this? It's uh, with the second stage fans running. It's good for 183 MVA, 183 megawatts basically. Uh, moving along, here's the tap changer. We've talked about this before. It, it will raise and lower the voltage on the low side depending on, well, plus 10%, minus 10% is how it works. So it will change the ratio of the transformer slightly while it is running to make sure that we have 34.5 always on the low side. These are very picky wind turbines. They want a precise voltage, and this is the way to do it. This will constantly fluctuate depending on the utility's voltage because the utility's voltage is always changing. It, it's, it's crazy how much that changes. I'm not gonna operate the fans, but I usually do. So there's two stages, probably, you know, these two are one stage and then the other three are the other stage and so on. But that, that's how it works. Of course, you've got your radiators here. That's your O-N-A-N, your oil, natural, air, natural. That's natural convection. The, the hotter oil goes up, kind of circulates back down as it cools, and then comes back up as it heats up again. So there is oil in between each one of these radiator fins, and it allows the air to blow through to help with the cooling. If you didn't have that, didn't have fans, this thing would overheat it would overheat or you would have to derate it down to a, a voltage or a, a amperage value that wouldn't overheat it and that would not be a lot. So that is how you're able to really supercharge your transformers to be able to handle more power is by adding these fans. All you have to do is keep it cool. So there's just some um, thermometers here that measures the winding temperatures, the oil temperatures. Uh, there's various alarm points that these should be set at. So when it gets to you know, a certain temperature, it will send an alarm. Once it gets to a high temperature, like maybe around 90 or 100, it will uh, throw in a big alarm and say, hey, trip me off. So it looks like they're kind of set here. Um, sorry, there we go. You've got one, I'm not sure what that is. This one's set at 75 C. This one's set at just above 100, and then this one is set at 100 and 25 seems kind of high but oh, maybe not for the winding the oil that would be differently high so I, I would bet you that it would trip off at this point this would be a high alarm this would be a low alarm 
um, and, and it has it for the oil and for the windings. So there's three winding ones here and an oil. So they're monitoring each specific winding. I don't know if that's quite necessary, but you need at least one, I guess. I'm surprised to do three. So yeah, so that, that is transformer protection right there. It's, a, it's like a mechanical temperature where if the temperatures hit certain levels, it will close or open contacts to send the appropriate alarms. So these wires are coming from inside the transformer running inside of this unit and then out through these um, these conduits here inside the control house. Uh, looks like we have, oh this is interesting, so these are discharge counters and milliamp counters, so uh, milliamp meters. So on these uh, lightning arresters, they've got, they've got the ground side of the lightning arrestor tied to these bus bars and they come down and run through, yeah. They run through this device and then to ground. So I guess they're monitoring the milliamps when it's energized. And then if those milliamps jump, then that would mean that you have some sort of lightning system, uh, event or transient overvoltage event. And it'll it'll knock this counter up. So that's interesting. I, I guess it's you know, obviously set at one because they maybe tested it. But you don't normally see these. I don't know why you'd need to, to monitor that this closely. But uh, that's a cool feature. So anyway, I'm just doing a quick walk around. I need to put some torque marks on the anchor bolts. General cleanup. Things like that. And we will move on to the low side. Alright, so on the low side, we've got our conductors coming to the low side bus. We've got a low side main switch. And we've got our neutral grounding reactor. We've talked about this neutral grounding reactor before. This is attached to the neutral of your transformer. And if you have some sort of ground fault and or um, phase, you know, differential, that difference will go to your neutral. And this basically kind of softens the blow of fault current that runs to ground. So if you had a ground fault, out in the field, a big one, all of that that energy is going to go to your neutral. And that's going to, depending on the size of your transformer, you're going to have a bigger fault current. So what this does is softens that blow and it allows you to have less of a neutral on your underground cables in the field. So if you didn't have this probably, I don't know, 50 grand-ish um, reactor, you would have to upsize your neutrals to handle that extra load because you didn't have this kind of reactor here to soften that. And it would probably cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars extra in copper for your conductor shield on your medium voltage cable. So this is a really cheap way to save a bunch of money. Um, so that's what that smaller size is for. It's a little small. I need to check into that, see if that's right. But at the same time, it should be there just for momentary faults. Um, and that would be like a cycle or two, right? So it doesn't need to be that big because it's only going to handle that crazy amount of amps for a short period of time, but I'm going to double check anyway. Uh, and then it runs to this insulated conductor. And it's insulated because if you were to be standing here, uh, you, would have, you would have a high voltage on this. And you wouldn't want to be standing here hanging out and have that voltage travel through your hand to the ground. So that's why it's insulated in case somebody is around here. Neutral grounding reactors, pretty neat, um, pretty simple design, but they do a lot for you and save you a lot of money. Hey, so when I was editing this video, just to make sure I got names and things taken out, I noticed that uh, this neutral insulator running to the neutral grounding reactor had this ground attached to it on the transformer. That's something that comes from the factory and that grounds it you know, directly to the ground. We actually need to go back and remove this piece from the insulator. Um, if you have a resistor in parallel with just a straight you know, line to ground, all of that current is gonna follow that line to ground. So having this piece installed from the factory is actually bypassing that neutral ground reactor and, and that will cause, cause issues in the field. So we're actually gonna go back and pull this piece of uh, bus off of that insulator so all of that fault current will run through that wire and through the neutral grounding reactor as it should. 
we've got our station service. This is where the wind farm is getting its power from. Well, to clarify, it's where the control house is getting its power from. And it taps on to one of the phases of your 34.5 through this fuse that isn't here. That's what we have to make a, a note about. And into the transformer that goes to 120 volts. So this is a 100 kVA. Uh, 19.9 to 122.40. When I say 19.9, that is 19,900 volts to ground on one phase. On phase to phase, you have 34.5. This is we're only grabbing one. This is a 19.9. Same with on the on the high side with the CCVTs we were talking about. They're not they're not 138 CCVTs. I think they're like 76 or something like that. Whatever that single phase to ground is. Getting pretty pretty into the weeds here on this. So we have uh, the PTs. Potential transformers, these take your your voltage, and again, it, like the other side, it drops it down to a manageable voltage, which is 69 volts and 117 usually, sometimes 120. So it's grabbing, it's so it's basically a 19,900 volt to 140, 240 transformer. But if you notice the size of that to the size of this, why the hell is this one so big? Well, because this one's providing actual amps, like a lot of amps to run the AC units, to run the battery chargers, to run all that stuff inside. So it's a lot of amps. You have to have a bigger transformer to handle that. These here are the same thing, but they're not they're not pu pushing any current really that's, that's big. All it's doing is running to a relay. Relays aren't going to use any power. It's just monitoring that voltage. So because there's no major loads on these transformers they can be very small if you were to ever hook up you know these conductors to this pt without protection you will literally melt it probably in three seconds so these are made these are also transformers no different than this they're just made for different amperages on the low side Let's see if this is unlocked doing a quick look they have duck seal it doesn't look great See, we need the uh, we need the fuses. The fuses go in here to protect to protect that unit from blowing up. I think we put like five amp fuses in here. So if anything is above five amps, um, these will blow instead of the PTs melting. So we need to get some fuses out here, some drawing cleanup. Um, this looks okay generally. So for feeder breakers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven feeder breakers. You see these a lot. These are called EMA breakers. That's who makes them. It is a grounding breaker. So what that means is when it opens, it grounds the far side. And how it does that, I mean, I'm not gonna open it up, but you can see down underneath here, that this is the bar that runs to the, uh, the bus on the low side for internally. So when it opens, it will ground the other side and it will bleed off any excessive voltage or power or anything that's left in that system from those turbines still spinning. So that's what these are. They're pretty neat. Patented, I believe. Grounding breakers. Uh, kind of unique to this station is they have some bird protection on here. There's tons of levels of bird protection. You could have this whole thing insulated. Here they just chose to put uh, the insulator baskets on to protect the birds if they get in between. Uh, and then you've got a little bit of insulation over the conductor there if it sticks its wings up or something like that. But I, I don't know. I, so I'm not an expert in this stuff. But what makes me wonder is that, okay, you've got these cages. But the cages are about an inch from the actual conductor inside, right? That's actual conductor. It's not, it's not insulated. That is, that is open, energized conductor. Same with the other side. So if a bird got in between there, you've actually got an air gap of one inch on that side and maybe an inch or two on, on this side, I think that will still close the gap and probably fry that bird. So maybe I'm missing something, but putting a bird in between there when this is energized with only three inches of air gap, I think it's not doing anything. That's me personally. But anyway, those are that's avian protection. Again, there's many different levels of, of avian protection. This is what the engineer chose on this project, or the owner. You don't see that in every substation. And then also you can see there's baskets on the insulator. Sorry, I know I'm in wide mode. I was going to show you a bunch of close-up stuff. But 
You can see the baskets around the insulators there. That's to keep the birds when they're standing up on the steel from standing up and then having their head touch the uh, conductor or the bus. Do a quick look in here again just to make sure that we've got everything cleaned up. A couple things we have to take care of there. The wiring is okay. Um, just some general cleanup we need to do in here. So here's the fuse actually. This is the fuse for that station service we were looking at. It's a SM5, it's pretty standard. 7E, that's the rating, so this is 7 amps. Why is it only 7 amps? Because it's on the primary side, right? Um, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but you can do the quick math on that. You're probably only running one or two amps on the primary side to get your um, your 100 kVA down here at the bottom. So I'll just lay this here. We still need the fuse holder though and the rest of it. Oh, we didn't talk about the switch. This is the low side main switch. This is a hand crank. So it's not a motor operated disconnect. It's a hand operated one. That's fairly normal for the low side voltages. We have to mount the uh, nameplate still on it. So it's closed now, we'll open it. So to open it, you twist this and you can see the axle slowly turning. All right, we need the name plates on these to open and close. And then as we're turning it, the linkage is lifting up the bus. It's hard to do this kind of one-handed. And then when it opens, which is open now, we should have a stop here. So yeah, the stop, this still needs to be adjusted because what it's supposed to do is hit right here. And then uh, conversely, when you close it, you want it to hit as well. So we need to adjust that. And we need those open and close signs up here we were talking about. It's a little bit of work there. Um, all the breakers are the same, so I won't go through every one of them with you. But just looking at things we can clean up, right? Need some torque marks. I turn the lights on to make sure all the lights are working. Need to operate the hook stick switches here. So these are single phase switches that you operate with the hook stick. I like to operate those now instead of when we're energizing because it's a lot easier to go up there with the lift right now when everything's dead and locked out as opposed to when you're energized and you have to shut the tra transformer off and just go through a bunch of hassle, right? So you've got your feeders coming from the field. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is your 35 kV underground cable. This is where I was talking about we save a bunch of money by putting the neutral grounding reactor and so we don't have to have as many copper strands in the concentric neutral on these cables because of that uh, reactor. So we actually saved money. Don't have to have as much. I did a separate video I'll link on the internals of this uh, 35 kV XLPE cable. So what else did I miss here? I've got more lights on. Maybe I shouldn't have done wide angle. I would show you the transformer, but there are some issues with that. It was provided by somebody else. Oh, capacitor bank, let's do that. So you guys have seen these before in my other videos. Sometimes you don't need a capacitor bank. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you need reactor banks as well. Sometimes you don't. In this one, we don't need any reactor banks. So it's just a little bit of capacitor banks. It's not many. Uh, but what this does is kind of help regulate the voltage. Um, there's, you know, KVA and then your kilowatts and your VARs. This helps clean up some of that dirty power that these wind farms produce as they're ramping up and as they're ramping down. So I can start with the circuit switcher. I don't have my, don't have my screwdriver, but I'll need to open that up. This is just a, it's basically a breaker, but we call it a circuit switcher. It opens and closes inside. You've got your power coming in on the top there of the insulator and then it comes out through the bottom. And there should be a either counter, there's no, that's the counter. On the other side, there's a visual open and close. And it goes through these filters. It's in a way, they're, they're reactors, but they call them uh, harmonic filters. Those are designed specifically to the wind farm. Uh, various things go into that. You could probably do a two hour video just on that alone, but these are the harmonic filters. It 
keeps down on the bad harmonics levels and then your capacitors. So these will, oh, and then your, um, you have a PT here, but you're wondering why, why do I have a PT on there? So that is running to ground. And you, if you have any imbalance on the system, because you have the same amount of capacitors for A, B, and C, right? I think it's top to bottom, like A, B, and C. If you blow a capacitor, these fuses will open. There's a spring in there to pop it out. Um, you'll have more, you'll have less capacitance on one phase than you do the other two. That imbalance will go to your neutral and it will induce a voltage onto the neutral. And this PT picks up that voltage. And if it's too imbalanced, it will say, hey, something's wrong. We should be equal. Um, open up, open up before we damage something. So that's what the PT is there for. It's there for protection of your capacitor bank. You also have a grounding switch. That's what this is. So if you want to work on this capacitor bank, it will store, it can store electricity. This is here to drain that electricity before you work on it. So even though it might be de-energized, there might be some stored power there. It has a Kirk key interlock system. We've also talked about that in another video. It allows you to not close this ground switch when you're energized. Right? You don't want to do that. You don't want to blow, blow anything up. So in order to get the key to open this, you have to go inside this box. You have to open the Kirk key interlock, or the open the switch, and that will allow you to pull the key out. If this was closed, you could not pull that key out, saying, hey, nope, I'm not going to give you the key to, to ground this because I'm still closed. So as soon as this is de-energized, pull the key out, Bring it over to the ground switch and open her up. Close her in, excuse me. Uh, we didn't talk about the, uh, the oil minder pump. So inside here is a pit. Well, it's a pit of rock, really, but it's got a big liner in it. And you can either do it this way or you can have a concrete containment. You've seen concrete containers from other videos as well. Uh, but this will separate the oil and keep uh, keep the oil from going in the ground. So there's a bunch of rock in here that'll absorb all that oil. It'll stay contained because of the liner. You can actually see part of the liner here. We need to clean it up a bit. There's part of the liner. And there's a sump here. It's a pump. And that pump will pump water, but it will not pump out oil. It will be able to tell the difference and it will stop pumping if it's oil. So it'll only eject out um, water and that runs outside the substation yard. and then there's a controller here for it. Oil minder control. So this will basically tell you if it's an oil fault, you know, high level, overload, a bunch of different stuff. But uh, this is a pretty intelligent pump that will pump water but not pump oil. I know this is a little quick today just because I'm going to grab some lunch, go back at it. But uh, this is a 138, 34, 5 substation for a wind farm and just kind of doing a quick punch list check of the yard that's kind of generally how i go but when i really do it i'll have a notepad in my hand instead of a phone all right thanks everybody